When I was 14, I wanted to be a doctor, the MD kind. As a study aid, I drew detailed diagrams of the organ systems of the human body, like the respiratory system, with inset diagrams of important organs like the lungs, and then zooming in even further to the tissue scale alveoli, which exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide to help us breathe. I spent hours, no, days <laughs> drawing these, and I faintly remember my mom walking into my room and telling me I'm spending way too much time on this. But I would pin these charts up on my walls, plop myself onto a bean bag, and just absorb. By the time I was 16, I had zoomed in even further to the microscopic world of molecular biology. I had been introduced to the study of genetics the year before, and I'd watched my grandfather wither under Alzheimer's. So I wanted to study the genetics of disease. Life had other plans, though. By the time I graduated, I had begun to focus on ecology, zooming out this time to the world of ecosystems, landscapes, and cities. What I didn't realize then, as I went from the study of anatomy and physiology to molecular biology to ecology, disappointed by my inability to stick to either of them, was that I'd been given the gift of thinking across scales. Thanks to that, a degree in biology, one in environmental studies, and one in urban planning, I now study complex systems. It's a set of things that are working together as part of a mechanism or a network. A complex system is one where those things are so interwoven that what emerges as a result of their interactions is hard to predict without studying the whole. That is an emergent property of a complex system. Cities are complex systems, and their resilience emerges from a complex panoply of interactions between social, political, ecological, economic variables, which tend to be studied in their own disciplinary silos. Resilience is crucial for systems to buffer them against shocks. And cities face multiple shocks today, pandemics, uh, climate change, and so much more. So it makes sense that governments are planning for resilience. In Richmond, there are community groups and um, government agencies and a variety of uh, private organizations that have been working tirelessly together to tackle multiple social, ecological challenges or shocks that the city faces today whether it's urban heat island effect, or urban flooding, or you know, food insecurity, inequity in access to green spaces. And one common strategy across all of these is urban greening. Green spaces and green infrastructure offer a variety of ecosystem services, whether it's water control and filtration to mitigate flooding, or shade that reduces um, heat island effect, or produce that people can consume to tackle food insecurity, and so much more. This is our natural capital. And researchers across the world have established that urban resilience is dependent on natural capital. But urban land is limited and so much in demand. So we need to plan for green spaces knowing that we cannot keep adding more. We might have to also strategize to enhance what we already have. Can a community garden project that's already focused at the scale of plant species selection also widen their horizon to include plants that support pollinator populations? Can a uh, tree canopy cover project also factor in site hydrology to address flooding since these two shocks tend to co-occur in the same neighborhoods? Can we think about connecting multiple green spaces across a landscape or a city in such a way that we not only support urban biodiversity by giving species dispersal corridors to move from one habitat patch to another, but then by doing that can also provide more communities access to green spaces? When we apply the lens of scale to think about green spaces, we can see all that they have to offer. But this is not a new idea. We've been mapping our natural capital in our city, on our campus. This map shows the green infrastructure locations on our campus. It was produced by a group of VCU researchers about a decade ago. And a few years before that, a map was created for the citywide network of green spaces and green infrastructure. But even if we can see all this natural capital, what we miss is the network of hundreds of state, civic, private organizations that are involved in the planning, designing, building, maintaining, and even the use and stewardship of these spaces. That is our social capital. 
relationships, connections, net, uh, links, that is a representation of social capital, which is why network maps like this can help us visualize that web of organizations and interactions. This network map just shows in the dark, uh, dark green nodes the green spaces and green infrastructure locations. And in light green nodes, you can see all the actors associated with them. And this is a very simplified map. But beyond giving us a bird's eye view of the web of interactions and actors, a network map can tell us a whole lot more. A network map can tell us which organizations or actors have the most projects, like these two that have about nine to 10 projects each. A network map can tell us if certain actors are getting clustered or siloed into their own network of relationships. A network map can tell us if there are actors who are bridging across those clusters and silos. A network map can tell us if there are actors who are on the fringes of the network and need more support and, and strategizing to be able to gain a footing into this space. A network map can tell us how to connect to actors that are far apart in the network. It helps us calculate multiple pathways to connect those two actors, but it is the situated knowledge that we as practitioners have about the projects and the actors along those pathways that can help us figure out which is the most feasible pathway. This is why a multidisciplinary team of VCU researchers is mapping Richmond's natural capital in the form of all our green spaces and green infrastructure at different scales, as well as the social capital, the network of organizations or actors affiliated with those projects. This is the Urban Green Equity and Resilience Project. At last count, we have over 800 projects and over 500 actors, and this map only shows half of that. As miraculous as our brains are, and they are, it's very difficult to map all of this and then maintain this complex network of connections in your mind. But we can use tools like this that not only allow us to have all of this complex multi-scalar information on the same platform, but also allows us to share this publicly in a visually intuitive and interactive way. One of the challenges that we face with the network map at this stage is that we've already connected hundreds of actors to hundreds of projects, but it's gonna take hundreds of interviews to really understand the dynamics of those relationships to be able to truly map and visualize our social capital. On the previous slides, you saw that actors can get clustered into their own network of relationships. Often the on-ground realities of dealing with just one of those shocks like flooding is so complex and challenging that it makes sense that actors to be able to accomplish something will get siloed into their own network of relationships. At the same time, there are other actors who are really well connected across the network. Meanwhile, there are many actors who are on the fringes of the network. Knowledge, skills, funding can get concentrated in these larger organizations and agencies. Meanwhile, neighborhood projects or community projects can be so small or few that they can get relegated to the fringes. This is why our team is mapping all our natural and social capital, all of the projects and all of the actors affiliated with it, and sharing it on this public open access platform so that everyone, irrespective of their resources, can understand their role, their projects, their relationships in the context of the entire network. I love being a small fish in a big pond. There is so much to learn in a big pond. My pet peeve is when I cannot see the whole pond. Our hope with a network map like this is that we can not only give the big fish an idea of the links and connections that they're missing, but also give resources and confidence to the small fish to move towards their targets. And by sharing this network map with a variety of stakeholders, we hope to be able to give them the tools that they can build the social connections that are needed to plan, design, build these spaces that we already know we must physically connect. Stephen Hawking said that this is the century of complexity. If we are to truly plan for urban resilience, we need to embrace this complexity and leverage tools like this that allow us to map those moving paths so that we can understand what will really enhance resilience. 
the Urban Green Equity and Resilience Project is taking one step in this direction. By mapping our natural capital and our social capital, we want people to be able to have the resources and knowledge to be able to connect our green spaces physically and develop the social connections necessary for that. And by sharing this map with the communities and practitioners that essentially live, breathe, and support these spaces in so many ways, we hope to give them the ability to imagine and then plan a more greener, connected, and therefore more resilient Richmond of tomorrow. Thank you.